Our doctor here is reading a genetic test report which details information about genomic variants that may be causative of a disease phenotype. As a clinician, you may be faced with having to explain a genetic test report to a patient. This webinar will help you understand genomic variants and their interpretation, allowing you to more effectively communicate these reports with your patients. What is a genomic variant, you may ask? A genomic variant is a variation, sometimes referred to as a mutation, occurring within the chromosomal sequence of an organism, or in other words, a genetic sequence which deviates from the reference sequence. The reference sequence is an annotated genetic sequence which provides information about the common allele at a given locus or genetic location. When we seek to understand the significance of this variant in pathology, we must interpret the variant. Variant interpretation is the process of seeking out information about the variant to come to a conclusion about whether it is causative of disease. Specific kinds of relevant information may include population evidence, functional data, and more, which we will discuss later in this video. This process is crucial to provide patients with an understanding of their disease and treatment options. Better understanding the pathogenicity of genetic variants additionally improves our collective understanding of the genome, getting us one step closer to treating genetic diseases. It's important that you understand the implications of genomic variants and their impact on disease so that you can provide better care to your patients and assuage some basic concerns in your consultations. This webinar will provide you with a sense of the relevant background so that you can easily interpret genetic testing reports and patient data. Understanding this information will also enable improved provision of patient-centered care. Moving on, there are multiple kinds of variant interpretation. We will focus on germline variants, which occur in the gametes and are inheritable. Specifically, we will focus on germline variants inherited in Mendelian fashion and are associated with monogenic diseases. Examples of commonly known diseases that originate from germline variants include Tay-Sachs disease and cystic fibrosis. Before diving into the specifics of variant interpretation, it is important to understand the types of variants, which will better help understand the process. We will look at a sample reference sequence and use this as a basis for assessing the types of variants. Let's explore what these are. First is a substitution. This occurs when one nucleotide is replaced with a different nucleotide. If the nucleotide change results in a different amino acid, the variant is referred to as a missense variant. If the nucleotide change introduces an early stop codon, it will result in the termination of protein synthesis. This is known as a nonsense variant. Second is an insertion, where one or more nucleotides are added to the genetic sequence. Third is a deletion, where one or more nucleotides are removed from the genetic sequence. This could range from a few nucleotides to a larger section of the sequence. Fourth is a deletion insertion, which occurs when at least one nucleotide is deleted and a new one is inserted at the same location in the genetic sequence. This type of genetic variant is also known as an indel variant or a delins variant. Fifth is a duplication. Here, a stretch of one or more nucleotides gets repeated immediately beside the original genetic sequence. Finally, when a variant causes a change in the reading frame of the nucleotides, it is called a frame shift variant. This can happen with insertions, deletions, or duplications that are not in groups of three nucleotides. The described variants can occur on various levels across the genome. When these variations occur on a small scale, that is to say a few or a single nucleotide, they are referred to as an SNV, or a single nucleotide variant. However, when variants occur on a much larger scale, affecting thousands or millions of base pairs at once, they are called copy number variants, or CNVs. Similarly to SNVs, CNVs can take on the form of an insertion, deletion, duplication, or indel. We will be focusing on SNVs. Now, you may be wondering about the clinical value of these variants and what this information means for you as a physician. When a patient completes their genetic test, the physician receives a test report. These reports are usually written in accordance with a set of guidelines used to determine the likelihood that a given variant is causative of the phenotype the patient presents with. The application of these guidelines may vary from lab to lab. Now, I will walk you through how to interpret and classify a variant. 
we will be focusing on the ACMG guidelines, which is one of the most commonly used frameworks for interpreting a variant. Let's talk for a moment about what the ACMG guidelines are. The ACMG guidelines are internationally accepted guidelines for the interpretation of variants. These guidelines were established by clinicians and clinical lab directors who are experts in clinical genetics and part of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the Association for Molecular Pathology, and the College of American Pathologists. Variants can be classified into five tiers depending on the applied criteria. Pathogenic, likely pathogenic, uncertain significance, likely benign, and benign. Different types of evidence are collected to make this classification, including gene level and phenotypic data, population data, computational data, functional data, segregation data, and de novo data. Let's have a brief look at what some of these mean. First, gene level and phenotypic data. This includes reviewing the literature and resources like OMIM and gene reviews to gain insights into the gene's function, associated diseases, and any known pathogenic variants. The patient's phenotype is then compared with established disease presentations, helping to determine whether the variant of interest might be contributing to the observed clinical features. Next, population data. The variant of interest is checked for its frequency in population databases like NOMAD. NOMAD is a data aggregate of sequencing results of visibly healthy individuals. By searching for our variant in this database, we can ascertain the allele frequency in the population. If it is not found commonly in this database, or if it is absent, it is believed that the variant is rare and may be pathogenic. We can also develop our sense of a variant's pathogenicity by assessing its biochemical effect. This means, for example, determining whether the amino acid is changed or checking for any already known variants at the same location which may shed insight into the potential outcomes of the variant in question. For example, if a missense variant in a kinase domain leads to reduced function of the gene and thereby a specific phenotype, a novel missense variant in the same kinase domain may be believed to result in that same phenotype. Computational data, such as in silico prediction tools or computational models, can also provide information concerning a variant's pathogenicity. Importantly, however, is that computational data in general is weighted with low priority. Next is functional data. Experimental studies aim to assess the functional effects of variants either in cell lines, animal models, or both. Observing a strong reduction in transcription or translation would support a variant's potential pathogenicity. Many different experiments can be done to evaluate functional effects, including ELISAs, Western blots, luciferase assays, and more. Cell lines are often chosen with the intent to be biologically relevant, that is, to model disease related to the patient's phenotype. And animal models may include mice with humanized organs. Segregation data is important to indicate whether the variant was found to occur with diseases across families. Typically, we would expect to see the variant and the disease co-occurring at a high frequency to interpret this as support for pathogenicity. Lastly, de novo data. A variant that is found to only occur in the child, but not in the parents, is called a de novo variant. De novo, meaning new. De novo variants are more likely to be pathogenic. Now, we'll take a look at a variant in a sample patient report. What does the information mean, and how can we interpret it? Let's take a look at the top of this report. The information at the top of this report refers to the details surrounding the patient and laboratory, such as the lab address and basic patient identifiers. Following this, we find basic information concerning what sort of testing was ordered and a summary of findings. 
This summary table includes the variant identified in the patient as a result of testing. Finally, the interpretation of the variant is provided here. In order to understand what a variant means, it is important to know the naming conventions. The standard method for naming variants is called the HGBS nomenclature. HGBS nomenclature is made up of three main components. The first part is the reference sequence identifier. This denotes the exact transcript in which the variant occurs. It consists of a prefix, followed by an underscore and a set of numbers. For example, NM indicates that this is a coding transcript and the numbers point to the gene to which this transcript belongs, as well as the transcript version. In this case, the transcript ID refers to the MSH6 gene. The second part is the variant description. This describes what change has occurred in the transcript. It can be represented as a genomic change, G, or more commonly a coding sequence change, C. For example, MSH6 C.642C to G means that at position 642 in the reference transcript, a guanine has replaced the expected cytosine. The third part is the protein consequence. Based on our knowledge of the genetic code, we can predict the consequence of a variant on the protein. If we look back at the transcript, we see that this variant changes a C to a G in this codon, which results in a stop codon instead of a tyrosine. Therefore, this variant is predicted to lead to a truncated protein. Note that the protein consequence is only present if the variant occurs in a coding region. Now that we understand how a variant is named, let's review the additional information provided on the report. Revisiting the data types discussed earlier, here we can see the gene level and phenotypic data, the biochemical predicted effect, and population data. Variants in the MSH6 gene are known to cause Lynch syndrome, a hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome, which is consistent with the patient's phenotype. The biochemical predicted effect, the nonsense variant, corroborates previously identified disease mechanisms in the MSH6 gene. Population data reveals a low prevalence in the population. Together, these support the classification of this variant as pathogenic. Following this information, recommendations are provided for future directions for the patient. In this case, genetic counseling is recommended for the patient and their family. Now, let's check your understanding. What information about the genomic variant is communicated by the following identifier? Take 15 seconds to note down your answer. This variant is a substitution of an adenine with a thymine at position 20 of the HBB gene, which causes the glutamine amino acid at position 7 of the protein to be replaced by a valine. Now that we have an understanding of germline variant interpretation, let's take a brief look at some other prominent forms of variant interpretation, pharmacogenomic and somatic variants. Let's first begin with the pharmacogenomic variants. You may be exploring treatment options for a patient and want to assess how your patient responds specifically to the drugs you have in mind. This is where pharmacogenomics comes in, the study of drug gene interactions. Pharmacogenomics is different in scope from germline interpretation, but seeks to similarly explore the impact on disease, more specifically drug response, as a result of genomic variation. Pharmacogenomics uses a star system to denote specific alleles and uses different databases and sources for evaluation of evidence. Grasping the framework used in the interpretation of your variant of interest is critical to understand the genotype-phenotype connection and ultimately the drug metabolism of your patient. 
For example, your patient may be a quick metabolizer of a given drug. Without genotypic information, you may be unsure as to why your treatment is ineffective. After evaluating the genotype of your patient, you may learn that the drug dosage was too low for their phenotype. This allows you to increase the dosage of the treatment to tailor the treatment per patient, allowing for stronger healthcare provision for the recipient and a better experience for both parties. In patients diagnosed with certain solid tumors such as colon cancer, DPYD gene testing may be useful to determine the dosage of chemotherapy. Germline variants in DPYD may predispose some patients to life-threatening toxicity when treated with fluoropyrimidines such as fluorouracil and capacitabine at standard doses. Variants in this gene can be interpreted according to specific pharmacogenomics guidelines to determine dosing recommendations. Similarly, patients who require the antiviral abacavir may benefit from HLA gene testing to identify patients who are at risk of severe hypersensitivity to this drug. Now let's explore somatic variant interpretation. Somatic variants do not occur in the gametes and are not inheritable such as variants in cancer cells. In this case, we are assessing the actionability of variants. In other words, the potential to treat that arise in oncogenes and tumor suppressors, genes that are key players in oncogenesis. Cancer is often linked to a driver mutation, a singular mutation in a cancer-related gene that propagates the cancer throughout the system and is the main target to address when treating cancer. Identifying this driver mutation is the goal of somatic variant interpretation. Understanding the impact of these variants is essential to understand which gene is associated with a patient's cancer and to determine how to most appropriately treat it. Similar to germline interpretation, population and functional data will help interpreters assess the role of these variants. Once the driver mutation for a cancer is identified, the interpreter analyzes existing clinical evidence to provide information regarding existing approved therapies or ongoing clinical trials for the variant. The physician can then use this information to determine which treatment is most appropriate based on the patient's driver mutation. For example, the oncogen BRAF is commonly mutated in several cancers. The presence of the V600E variant in a patient's tumor qualifies them to receive specific FDA-approved therapies such as encorafenib and panitumumab. Both pharmacogenomics variants and somatic variants are interpreted using a different set of guidelines based on clinical actionability rather than pathogenicity. These are some examples of the different categories of variant interpretation and the ways in which variant interpretation can be a powerful tool to improve your provision of care and your patient's experience. Let's take a minute to reflect. Describe the different kinds of variant interpretation and their utility in a clinical setting. If you're able to do so successfully, that means you've understood the basics of variant interpretation. In this webinar, we explored five key topics, types of genomic variants, germline variants and their interpretation, pharmacogenomic variants, somatic variants, and even examined a sample genetic testing report. Variant interpretation can be a powerful tool to diagnose disease and provide precision care, and to improve patients' understanding of their condition. Knowing the specific genetic etiology of a patient's disease may open up options for specific targeted therapies and an improved quality of life.